Open with me to Mark chapter 10 this morning, if you would. Mark chapter 10, we'll look at verses 13 to 16. This is what the Word of God says. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Jesus took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now, as I've simply read those four verses over you this morning, regardless of your familiarity, how much you may or may not know about this passage, by simply just reading it right now, it is abundantly clear that somehow or there's something about the message that Jesus is trying to get uh, across in this passage is deeply linked, deeply connected with the child in all of us. Yes. We all have a child within all of us. Sometimes we're more childish instead of being childlike, as Jesus calls us to. There is a huge difference. And I find it interesting. Here it is, the first Sunday after Christmas. And the message that Jesus is speaking directly to our lives this morning from Scripture has to do with the child in all of us. Christmas, unlike any other holiday. I believe, brings out the child in us more than any other holiday. There's so much to get excited about. The gift giving, the decorations, the lights, the singing, all the visiting with family and friends, the food, must I go on? But it's this holiday, Christmas, that brings out the child within us like no other holiday. And you're thinking, wait a minute, what about Halloween? Halloween ain't a holiday. How many days of school you get off for Halloween? Zero. Christmas is a holiday, Okay. I'm still credible. You can listen to the rest of the sermon now. Only Christmas, think about this. Only Christmas do you find grown men come to a place of acceptance to clothe themselves in adult size onesie pajamas. But it doesn't stop there. Not only does Christmas bring grown men to a place of wearing adult size onesie pajamas, But they also come to a place, because of Christmas, men come to a place of wearing these adult-sized onesie pajamas that are perfectly coordinated with their entire family. Christmas. It doesn't stop there. Not only does Christmas bring a grown man to the place of wearing a full-size adult onesie pajama that is in full harmony and matching with their family, but for whatever reason, because of Christmas— And in bringing the inner child out of every one of us, these grown men are also okay with providing these images of themselves matching in these adult-sized onesies for public consumption. Look at these examples. I'm kidding. Some of y'all were scared. I pulled your Facebook photos and put them up here, weren't you? God, I should have done that. But here in today's passage... Jesus, the heart of his message, he's getting across in this situation of his earthly ministry. He is so emphatically stressing the reality that as followers of the king, the calling we have on our lives to have a faithfulness to the king at all costs demands we acknowledge and embrace the child in all of us. So here's the situation. We see it just laid out right there in verse 13. It says, They were bringing children to Jesus, him being Jesus, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. So who's these people bringing these children? Apparently there's moms, dads, maybe single parents, maybe grandparents who have been raising their grandchildren because mom and dad weren't available. Maybe community leaders or different adults who in their region have children who are completely helpless. Certainly included in these children that are being folded up in the arms of these adults, caring to Jesus for a hopeful encounter with Jesus. 
Surely these children have some type of birth defects. Certainly these children have been viewed physically and mentally by society as helpless, of no value, having nothing to offer for benefit. And it's in this humiliation, it's in this desperation that these moms and dads are carrying their children hoping to encounter Jesus, that Jesus might touch them, representing that Jesus might bless them, that Jesus might extend favor of his grace toward them that the hand of this world has not dealt them. And it's in this public humiliation and desperation that we then see this response at the end of verse 13. Such a dastardly demonstration of the disciples. They don't politely shoo these children away. They don't say, hey, here's some encouraging words to go home with. They rebuke them. They speak so harshly toward them and the audacity of them hoping to actually bring their children to Jesus, and they send these the most needy, most vulnerable, and exposed of the children population away. And at first, it's just, why? I mean, we all, when, when we share stories about the disciples, yes, there are so many bonehead decisions that we think, okay, yeah, Peter's always putting his foot in his mouth. I, I see him doing that. Yeah, I can relate to that. But this one just seems like it's so out of left field. Really? These disciples following Jesus are turning the most needy away? Why? Well, it's really twofold. There in that situation, the context of following Jesus, you had the Greco-Roman world having influence over your lives and the culture. And then you had the Jewish world and their influence over your culture. And so on one side, the Greco-Romans had this view toward children— that rarely, if ever, was a positive view. When it came to children, according to these Greco-Romans, could these children be exposed to profit or benefit adults in different industries? And if not, how can we most quickly and efficiently dispose of them? I mean, you can look up historical documents. 375 AD, there's a, a man whose wife is expecting a child and in written correspondence, he says, hey, honey, so excited. If it's a boy, we're so excited. If it's a girl, be sure to terminate her and kill her as quickly as possible. How can the children be exposed for the profit of adults? And if not, they have nothing to offer, so let's just terminate them. And in the merciful situations, they'd be killed and terminated quickly. Hopefully as minimal pain as possible. But most often was the case, and the less creative of methods was simply leaving these newborn babies out exposed in the elements that nature may take its course. And if those children weren't fortunate enough for nature to take their course and end their lives, they would be swooped up and robbed by other men and women only to expose them for the rest of their lives. So there's this dominating Greco-Roman perspective on children very society-driven. But then on the other side, there's this Jewish influence. And you're thinking, okay, surely the Jewish influence would be positive. Surely the nation that God established to bring forth Messiah would have some type of positive balancing out of the equation. No. Greco-Roman perspective was societal. The Jewish was more spiritual. But it's so selfish, so inward focused, so works based. See, the Jews, remember, God revealed himself to them in the Old Testament, beginning there in the Ten Commandments, he revealed his glory to them and, and how he had a holy standard, and they would never live up to his standard, but the grace and truth that God extended to the Old Testament nation of Israel was that by faith you are reckoned righteous before God. They struggled accepting that. And instead, from the Jewish side of the equation, it was always about work and legalism and doing all you could to mount accomplishments and earn favor in the eyes of God. 
So if there ever were a child involved in the equation, a child is helpless. A child has nothing to offer. A child is a hindrance. A child has no way of accomplishing things or promoting him or herself to earn favor and prominence before humanity, much less God. So here were those disciples with this Grecan Roman societal influence. And then these disciples were the, the Jewish spiritual influence that was so perverted. These followers of Jesus, the most closest of men and women following Jesus during his earthly ministry, turn away those most needy. It's at this point, Jesus offers a response. And the response captured in this narrative describes him being indignant. That's a nice way of saying that Jesus responds in a way unmatched in any other narrative account of his public ministry with the exception of one time. You may remember during the last week, Jesus was on earth before crucifixion, Holy Week. He was there at the temple, the house of his father, which was designed to be a house of prayer. But thieves and robbers had come in and they'd abused it. They perverted it. So Jesus, Indiana Jones style, crafts his own handmade whip, starts cracking and popping and slashing. He overturns the tables and he runs the thieves out of his father's house. He became indignant. That's exactly how he responded to his disciples in this situation. See, the disciples at this point, they were epitomizing what Proverbs chapter 19 speaks against. The disciples saw these children coming. They saw nothing they could offer them, so they rejected them. Proverbs 19.4 says, wealth brings many new friends. I've never known that, but I've known people like that. But a poor man is deserted even by his friend. You ain't got nothing to offer? Deuces. Proverbs 19.6. Many seek the favor of a generous man. If we know there's someone in our lives who are coming across our path who can offer me something or, or help me get ahead, oh, come on, I'm seeking you because you're a generous person. Everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. These who were bringing those children in such a humiliating and desperate fashion had nothing the disciples saw that they could offer them, so they rebuked them. They said, go where you came from. Jesus saw it. He was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. I mean, he's emphatic. He says the positive side and the negative side. Let them come to me. You must allow them to come to me. And then do not hinder them. Quit getting in the way. You should proactively search out creative and effective ways to draw these children to me. Find possible avenues where you can increase and enhance the opportunity for them to come and encounter me. And while you're doing that, don't you dare do anything or suggest anything or even think of anything that might pose as a hindrance or a slowing down of any of these coming to me. So it's this powerful why or the what, and then he gives the why behind it. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Let them come to me. Don't you hinder them because they are mine. Now I think we're getting a little better sense of why he became so indignant. These disciples, these closest of men and women following Jesus during his, per his earthly ministry were getting in the way of those who belong to Jesus having access to encounter Jesus. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And at this point, in the context of the situation, Jesus speaks this powerful why, this, this reason, this purpose behind it, this, this theological truth into the specific situation presented at hand. But then he also zooms out and gives a, a greater reality as well. If you remember uh, last week, the beginning of chapter 10, really encouraging Christmas warm fuzzy sermon on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Can I get a witness? But if you remember... 
All this section of the book of Mark is about is Jesus teaching about the kingdom, teaching about what it looks like to have a faithfulness to the king at all costs, and he's speaking toward it in these specific different discourses. And so the beginning of chapter 10, someone brings up this crazy question about marriage, divorce, remarriage. So he provides a specific truth on that topic, but then he zooms out and says, don't miss the forest. Here's what it means to follow me radically as I call you to. Here's what it means to be fully devoted, following after me, having a faithfulness at all costs. And what that summarized to in, in Mark 10, 1 to 12, yes, it provides insight to divorce and marriage and remarriage, but ultimately it's a reminder that as a follower of Jesus, someone who says, I'm faithful to the king at all costs, there will be no area in your life that is divorced from the lordship of Jesus Christ. And Jesus does the exact same thing here in chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. He speaks specific to children, and then he'll zoom out and give the greater truth of the greater reality of what it looks like to have a faithfulness to the king at all costs. So here we go with verse 14. Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And here's where I insert one of my most beloved Aggie jokes. And I can do it today because we're a week removed from processing the reality that we got scammed by Kirk Herbstreet and all those people from ESPN. Nobody watches college football? Come on. We deserve to be number one in the nation. We're still number five. That's all there is to it, okay? How do you know all Aggies will go to heaven? Because they believe in Jesus. Sorry, Levi, that is not true. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm, my boy. Because no Aggies ever reach the age of accountability. I'm just, just the humility for me to stand before you and, and give you that, right? I could have chosen any other God-forsaken university, but I chose his most beloved and precious, Texas A&M. Okay, that's, that's comical, that's humorous, but in all sincerity, check this out. Verse 14, when Jesus says, let the children come to me, for to such belongs the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. This is an extremely encouraging verse. He's saying, they are mine. What he's getting at here truly has connections with accountability. He's saying, there are children, there are human beings out there who have no capacity to come to an extra intellectual decision to either accept Jesus or to reject Jesus. And among those most vulnerable, most needy, they are mine. It's encouragement, guys. For those who have experienced life in the womb only to lose it, be it by an undesired miscarriage or even a desired sinful choice of abortion, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. There has been a provision that when that embryo, that, that conception has passed through miscarriage or sinful abortion, they have been received into the arms of Jesus Christ forever and ever. There's great encouragement in this verse for those who have had the privilege of delivering life into this world, but then for whatever reason, their plight in life, God's sovereignty in that situation, you've only had moments, minutes, if maybe even seconds to hold him or her there, only for then their body to pass lifeless before you. Jesus says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And at that moment, Jesus reaches his arms out and welcomes them into everlasting life. So Jesus is talking here that... In a sinful, fallen world, there are human beings from the point of conception to their last breath. Some human beings never come to a place of intellectually being able to either accept or reject Jesus. And because his justice is never cheapened or disappointed, he receives them to everlasting life. So let's talk about this for just a second, guys. Am I suggesting that children are innocent? Whew. Some, view, some would view it that way. I mean, check this out. Some who have little experience with kiddos, they think this is really what it is, right? Man, those are some good-looking kids. Let's just spend some time right here, okay? They got some good-looking ears. 
and we just think it's so peaceful. But anybody who's had any experience with children know this is more often the reality. <laughs> Judah, the one whose name literally in the Hebrew means praise to the Lord. Yeah, praise to the Lord for spilled milk. Not only that, there's another picture, not today, but there's another picture of a broken glass. And all of this happened on my beloved bride's birthday. So he made matters worse. I made matters worse because I wasn't so childlike that day for whatever reason. I was acting more childish. And this compounded matters absolutely. Children are messy. Never-ending spilled milk. Never-ending broken objects. I mean, our frames down our beautiful hallway don't have glass in them any longer because they've fallen so many times. We just got tired of replacing it and sweeping it up. They're not innocents. And we know this. Don't take it from my own experience. Take it from Scripture. Psalm 51, verse 5. King David said, From conception, I was conceived. I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin, my mother conceived me. In no way is he saying, um, My mom and dad had me outside of wedlock. What he's referring to here is a sinful nature that every human being has planted inside of them at the moment of conception as a result of the original fall. So no kid is innocent. How else do I know? Romans 6.23. Death proves it. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of the sinful nature in every human being, we are deserving of physical death and everlasting separation from our maker. So we know children are not innocent when they're conceived, no matter, even if they're almost as cute as our own four children. They're evil, they are vile. They are more sticky and disgusting than the milk that sits under the crevices of the table that you don't notice until six months later. And they deserve death. So scripture says, that's why miscarriages happen. Because of the fallen nature of sin, even within the womb. That's why newborns die. It's evidence of their unrighteous standing before the Lord. But they belong to the kingdom because they've never come to a place of intellectually deciding yes or no to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Don't take my word for it. Take the word of God. 2 Samuel chapter 12. The same guy, King David from Psalm 51. He had this adulterous affair. He had a baby with a woman who was already married. And her husband, he sent out to the front lines and had him murdered. And when this baby was delivered, he became very sick. And it was apparent that he was going to die. And King David was, was grieving and fasting and praying, Lord, would you heal my kid? Would you spare him? This went on and on. And eventually the baby died. And his servants were terrified to come tell King David of the news that the baby actually passed because they'd seen how intense things were in his prayer life, praying for healing. Only God knew how crazy he might be when he discovered his baby actually passed. But when they shared the news that his baby had passed, David put off the fasting. He put off the grieving. He rose and he ate. And they asked, why? Why did you do that at the news of your baby passing? He says this, now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? The rhetorical question, absolutely not. I shall go to him. He will not return to me. Some suggest the comfort David finds is that one day King David's dead body will lay next to the dead body of his, born, his son there. Is that comforting? No, there are people who've gone to seminary and suggest that and published works on that. No, what is comforting is knowing that Jesus says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And he opens his arms and welcomes them in. And even in the Old Testament, based on the faith that reckoned King David righteous before God, he knew he would go to him in the arms of Jesus forever and ever. So we come back to Mark chapter 10. See this encouraging truth, this theological truth specific to children. We see how everlasting life for these children comes at death. I want to hit this real quick because there might be the question, wait a minute, are children, although they're not innocent, are they born saved? 
if they're born saved, once they commit a sin, are they then unsaved? Interesting argument. God promises eternal life, and once he provides eternal life, it is secure for all eternity, never to be plucked from his hand. So no, when you're conceived, you're not saved. But what Scripture shows is that when someone dies, before having the intellectual opportunity to accept or reject Jesus, at the point of their death, they then pass to everlasting life. That's the critical bridge, because as Jesus now zooms out, and wants to speak to the greater reality, the greater truth of what it looks like to have a faithfulness to the king at all costs, we must remember the death that is required. If anyone would come after me and follow me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, representative of sure death, and follow me. For us as believers here today, when was the moment our eternal life, our everlasting life was secured? It was the moment that by faith, we died to our old selves. In that moment, we're saved and secured for all eternity. So zoom out here. So Jesus, he gives this phrase, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And he provides a specific truth about children, but it's not only limited to physical or biological children. It's more about the spirit behind it. Remember earlier I said, we know there's a huge difference. And to my embarrassment, I know there's a huge difference between being childish and being childlike. Jesus calls us to be childlike, not childish. It's the spirit, this disposition of humiliation and desperation. Just as we see these adults and loved ones carrying their children humiliatingly, um, such humiliating fashion, desperate before Jesus, it's the reminder that's exactly how we've all come to him to begin with. It's a helpless child. Nothing to offer. No merit of our own. Not only that, but so vile and evil, just getting in the way. But it's when we die to ourselves, it's when we're aware and we have nothing to offer and we are helpless before Almighty God that Jesus steps in and says, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And just as it's described at the end of this passage, he opens his arms, he welcomes you in, and he blesses you, and he secures you. One last thing I do want to mention here. I think we struggle with this within the church more than any other place. We know children are blessings, but we know they are awfully so messy. We know they can be a royal pain more times than it seems like they're a royal joy, though we know that's not the truth. There is endless spilled milk. There is endless broken glass. There are picture frames that are continually having to be replaced and remounted on the walls. But we also know it's worth it. See, the message Jesus is talking about here, just as much as he's saying he's got these children secure, just as much as he's emphasizing that he has every one of us secure when we come to him with a helpless disposition of, of recognizing we offer nothing, just as critical as that is, what's also just as critical is us not being childish, but us staying out of the way of those who are coming to him. He's focusing on the, the next five guests who come through this building and that we as believers might be proactive in doing all we can to creatively and effectively draw them to Jesus unto salvation. And when we commit ourselves to that, to which your leadership here, we are committed to that, whatever it looks like, things do get sticky. Things do get messy and are challenging. Just, just like a helpless child, things are a mess. You bring an unbeliever in who's got the history of addictions and living a life outside the lordship of Jesus. Failures happen. Setbacks um, set in. But what Jesus is calling us to is to remember how helpless we were when we came to him and have this renewed commitment to those who are out there, to some who are in here this morning, who are completely helpless before the Lord. 
have nothing to offer, and the only assurance they have is that if they die today without accepting Christ as Savior, they will spend an eternity in hell. Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. As I know our time is running out this morning, but there's one more thing I want us to do as we're gathered this, in this place. Kiddos, you awake? Kiddos, you with me? Raise your hand if you're, you're a kid here. If you are 18 years or younger, I want you to come down to these steps for a moment. Stretch the legs out, guys. 18 years or younger. I'm not going to check the ID cards. Come on down here. Y'all can, y'all can have a seat. Find a seat on your favorite step here. We'll give you time, guys. Anybody want to come up here? 18 years or younger. And if you need your mom or dad to come with you, that is okay. Guys, I want y'all to listen to something really important. Okay, guys? Y'all listening? Guys, y'all listening? The latest stat. 77% of believers come to salvation at a moment in their lives where they are of 18 years of age or younger. More than three out of every four children come to salvation before their 19th birthday. You look up here just right now in this briefest moment, four, eight, we've got 12 up here. We have the opportunity over the next 10, 18 years in the lives of these children to do all we can to draw them to Jesus. All we can to point them to the cross because we know what happens as they get older. Is what we've experienced ourselves. See the stat for these precious ones that Jesus says, let them come to me, do not hinder them, for to such is the kingdom of God. These three out of every four, before 18 years old, if they're going to be born again, it's happening then. But for the rest of the population, 19 years and older, less than 25%. If you're here this morning, and you're not on stage with us, You have less than a 25% chance there within that population of becoming a believer now from the point of now until you breathe your last breath. Why is that? They're in tune with the child inside of them. They realize there's some things they can do, but they realize there's a whole lot of other things they've got no shot at doing or accomplishing on their own. So they're open and receptive to the reality That if there are so many things on this earth that they're unable to do in their own strength, how could there ever be any ability within themselves to achieve everlasting life before an almighty holy God? So they're more receptive to humiliate themselves and express their desperation for a Savior in Jesus Christ. But as we get older... And maybe you're here today, and you're 19 years or older, and you've never professed Jesus as Savior. Let me tell you, as you get older every single moment, your heart becomes more callous, because as you're older and more successful, you're able to do more things on your own, and Satan convinces you that if you're able to provide and secure things for yourself here on earth, then surely you're able to work enough or do enough good things to find favor in the eyes of an eternal, holy God. And that's not the case. But if you're here this morning, I'm going to pray in just a moment. We're going to sing one final song before we're dismissed. If you're here this morning, it's because God Almighty has orchestrated your life to hear him speak to you through his word and remind you that apart from the works accomplished through Jesus, And in light of his holy, righteous standard, you have nothing to offer him. You are helpless as a child condemned to everlasting torment. But he says to you, let those who are childlike come to me. 
For to such belongs the kingdom of God. And during our final song, if if that's you and you were to walk this aisle and say, I want to make Jesus my Savior, just as described in this narrative, he will open his arms, he will receive you and embrace you, he will lay his arms on you, he will enter into your life and become your Lord for all eternity. And children, I want you to hear one more thing to me. Look at me. I want to see every one of you looking up here, okay? As you get older... As you get older, if you don't make a profession for Jesus, you're going to be tempted to be convinced that you don't need him. God, who died for you and rose from the dead, did so that you might live with him forever. But as you get older, you're going to be convinced or tempted not to believe that. And so as Pastor Coleman prays in just a moment, you're going to walk back to your mom and daddy. And if there are any of you, just like I've talked to the adults out here, if any of you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, it doesn't take you knowing all the Bible. It just takes you having a faith like a child to believe he died for you and rose from the dead. Maybe you need to go tell mom or dad that you want to be saved today. And you'll have the greatest joy of walking back up here to to meet me or meet Miss Meredith who will be here. And we'll talk you through those next steps. Guys, y'all go back to your family. Let me pray for us, church.